Um, we've been discussing what evolution in terms of adaptive radiation on that very first or very important one, uh, anywhere from six to eight million years ago of bipedalism. Uh, we don't know who that last common ancestor he shared with apes, from which all bipedal creatures will eventually evolve, and even chimpanzees and bonobo will evolve around their uh, line. Um, we talked about all those different morphological changes in becoming bipedal. That's not just a matter of standing upright, but physical changes in the skeletal system, in the muscular system, even in the brain cooling system to make bipedalism a very effective form of a locomotion. Uh, second adaptive radiation, one that led to those dietary specialists, all those robust australopithecines, or what today are called paranthropus. There are numerous species of these eight different species of robust australopithecines. We're going to lump them all together as robust australopithecines. None of them are online to us. They are all dietary specialists. At the same time, about the same time as we have this one adaptive radiation of dietary specialists uh, avoiding falling off the side, we have another branch of larger brain cultured creatures. Um, we've been discussing what evolution in terms of adaptive radiation on that very first or very important one, uh, anywhere from six to eight million years ago, of bipedalism. Uh, we don't know who that last common ancestor he shared with apes, from which all bipedal creatures will eventually evolve, and even chimpanzees and bonobo will evolve around their uh, line. Um, we talked about all those different morphological changes in becoming bipedal. That's not just a matter of standing upright, but physical changes in the skeletal system, in the muscular system, even in the brain cooling system, to make bipedalism a very effective form of a locomotion. Uh, second adaptive radiation, one that led to those dietary specialists, all those robust australopithecines, or what today are called paranthropus. There are numerous species of these eight different species of robust australopithecines. We're going to lump them all together as robust australopithecines. None of them are online to us. They are all dietary specialists. At the same time, about the same time as we have this one adaptive radiation of dietary specialists uh, avoiding falling off the side, we have another branch of larger brain cultured creatures. Us, yay. So, uh, um, called Habilis, it's originally called a Homo Habilis uh, by Lewis Leakey. Um, he called him Homo Habilis because he's the very first uh, uh, species found in direct evidence with stone tools. Okay, it's not the stone tools that make him so important per se, but it's stone that survives the geological record. Uh, from the neck down, the skeleton of Homo habilis differs very little from the Australopithecines. For that matter, the difference between the gracile Australopithecines, such as Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, or Australopithecus africanus, those are both gracile uh, uh, types, and then those more robust Australopithecines, from the neck down, they are very, very similar. It's from the neck up in the cranium where we find major uh, distinction, those robust Australopithecines that are eating real hard things, or in the case of us, significant, uh, an increase in cranial capacity, larger brains. Okay, uh, so uh, uh, Homo habilis, also referred to as early Homo, uh, has an increase in, in brain size, about 700 uh, cubic centimeters, and some reorgan uh, reorganization of the uh, uh, structure. Uh, they're found throughout East Africa, South Africa as well. Some of the distinguishing features is it has a higher and rounder cranium. I don't have a model of uh, early homo, but a, ha a higher and rounded cranium. A less robust skull than what we find in the Australopithecines, even those Gracile Australopithecine. It has a less prognathic face. 
The face is flatter. The face does not jut out as the Australopithecines do. <coughs> it has a parabolic dental arcade. Uh, if you recall that the parabolic uh, shape of the upper jaw, the upper maxilla, is what we have. Uh, apes have parallel uh, rows of, uh, uh, of teeth. And the Australopithecines, they have an overall somewhat parallel uh, 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 rows of teeth, but then at the back, they tend to taper inward. The incisors of uh, 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 early homo are, are large, they're spade-like, very s uh, smaller uh, uh, molars and narrower premolars, and males are about five feet tall. Females somewhat shorter. Not as much sexual dimorphism in the early hole as we find in our Um In general, in our species today, males tend to be larger than females, um, but we are not a terribly sexually dimorphic species. Uh, males are not significantly larger than females, and actually, if we think of all the variation found among our, our species, there are a lot of there's a lot of overlap. There's some very tall females and some short males, and the rest is somewhere in between. Okay, so um, uh, this species has a, a, a significantly larger brain than the Australopithecines, and those Australopithecines had brains pretty much in line with chimpanzees, maybe slightly larger, but not significantly so. So this is really what it looks first. It got these first hominid species that has an increase in brain size. And is found in direct association with stone tools, which means these are cultured creatures. Why is this important? Because we use culture as our primary means of adaptation. And specifically, we use technology to adapt to every environment on Earth. So when we find tools associated with the species, it's significant. That's why Lewis Leakey um, named him Homo habilis handyman. Well, first, let's see, he provided the, the uh, name Homo. Right, folks, we are all Homo, as I keep uh, mentioning this class. Our genus uh, uh, Homo and habilis handyman. He called him handyman because he's the very first species found in direct association with tools. Uh, and Homo man because he was significantly different from the Australopithecines. Uh, actual brain uh, uh, size increase is about 20% over the, uh, uh, Austral the uh, uh, Australopithecines. Okay, so this is right in your book. Right out of your study guide. I wouldn't write it down. It's right in your books. Uh, but I want to kind of review what we've been discussing in the last uh, a week or so uh, and what are called the Pleistocene hominins, those bipedal creatures from the end of the Pliocene into the, the Pleistocene of uh, today. Uh, specimens recovered represent approximately 200 individuals from South Africa and more than 300 from East Africa. No, these are not complete skeletons. When we say individuals, we mean all of the fauna, all of the uh, uh, bone fragments <coughs> together represent approximately 300 individuals. But they're fragmentary. They are not, uh, with few exceptions, uh, complete uh, uh, individuals. And all of these specimens um, are divided into three broad uh, categories. Uh, the pre-Australopithecines, or what are called the basal uh, hom uh, hominins, from about 7 million years ago to 4.4 million years ago, uh, Salhanthropus chadensis, or Rorituganensis, and Artipithecus reminis. Of these pre-Australopithecines, which one is, uh, or which ones are definite hominins? That would be declared definite bipedal creatures. Uh, to date, these two, they may very well all be bipedal creatures, but uh, um, there's still these two, Solanthropus and, and Aurora, and Aurora at 6 million, Solanthropus at 7 million, um, they're pretty much indicated as possible 
some textbooks say probable, but not every, they have not been accepted by all uh, uh, paleo anthropologists as full-fledged uh, hominin species, bipedal uh, species. Not every, very likely, but not, we're no definitely artificially just by about five uh, and a half million years ago. Is that why, like, would the reason be that they're pelvis? Uh, well, no, I'd say no pelvis has been found. It's really the fragmentary nature of the remains. Um, so few remains have been found of Solomon Anthropus and Baroda Chiganensis that investigators are willing to put their careers on the line and say, yes, they're definitely hominins. We know the form and magnum of Solomon Anthropus is somewhere intermediate between uh, an ape, a token in the back, and a full fledged bipedal creature. But uh, researchers who have not declared this definite hominins are waiting for additional fossil evidence. Okay. Um, according to uh, the molecular clock and those nucleotide differences between bipedal creatures and us and chimpanzees, we expect to find the, the, those fossils or you know, when did bipedalism occur sometime six uh, uh, to eight million years ago. Finding the fossil evidence for that is more challenging. And we're beginning to find some, but uh, definite bipedalism by five and a half million years ago. Okay, the second set, those uh, uh, Australopithecines, the early primitive forms, such as Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy, um, uh, uh, first occurring about 4.2 million years ago until 3 uh, million uh, years ago. We could also include Australopithecus africanus uh, as well. And then somewhat later, by 2.5 million years ago, those uh, more derived Australopithecines, and by that I mean those robust Australopithecines that go by a variety of species names, None of them are along, are along, along the line to, uh, uh, none of us, none of them related to us. Dietary specialists that we're going to lump all together and call them robust Australopithecines. About the same time that that uh, derived line is going to those dietary specialists, this larger brain cultured species appears. And that's early, uh, uh, early Homo. Uh, definitely Homo habilis. Uh, and there's a, a significant amount of this fossil material to uh, uh, suggest that they're dealing with more than one species. And hence, Homo rubolfensis is also thought to be a, a species, contemporary species with a, a Homo habilis. How are we doing so far? Okay, so we pretty much just uh, uh, summarized